All right, welcome to a brand new week. Today we're actually going to do two different lectures, and I'll split the uh, recordings into two as well. Uh, today we're going to be talking about pointers uh, again, because pointers are fun and they're they're useful, and also students don't understand them very well. So uh, one of the fundamental things you need to know about a pointer is that pointers and arrays are, are kind of interchangeable. They're not exactly the same thing. Sometimes you'll hear me say um, pointers are arrays and arrays are pointers, and by and large, that's true. But they're actually different types, and and like an array actually has you know data associated with it, whereas a pointer is just a memory address. But like for a function that takes an array as a parameter, it'll take a pointer as well. Um, so the types can oftentimes be interchanged. So for example, if I come into a new code here and I make our integer array six like this, there's six elements in it, right? R, if I see out R, and I'll initialize the array to zero. Uh, the equals uh, open close brace. We'll put a zero into each of these values here. Actually, I guess I can put in here zero, 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 zero. There we go. It's zero filled. So what do you think this is going to print to the screen? If I print out the value of R, what is that going to print to the screen, do you think? What is R? R is an array. I'm not printing out R0, square bracket 0. I'm printing out R. <coughs> R. Uh, the answer is uh, not, it's not going to print the array. The R is a pointer. And so whenever you see out a pointer in um, C++, you get a memory address. Okay. So what if I was to print out R followed by R plus one. And remember, every time you run this, you're going to get a different memory address because R is stack allocated, right? So every time you run your program, it's going to be a little bit different on stack. That's okay. So what is this going to print? Uh, when I print out R, I haven't recompiled it yet. I'm going to print out R, and then I'm going to print out R plus one. What do you think that's going to print? Another address, the address of the first index. Is it going to print out like if if twenty was you know nine twenty? I'm getting rid of the upper part here. If nine twenty was the address of the first of R, what is it going to print out? Nine twenty one or nine twenty four? What do you guys think? And the answer is yeah, it's going to print out four higher because here is learning point number one for today. When you add to a pointer, it moves that many array elements right. <clears throat> so if your array elements are four bytes each, like an init, then it moves four bytes right. And that's why we're getting deck zero and deck four uh, as AB zero, AB four. So, uh, what if we were to print out array plus two? How far to the right of R is that going to be? It's going to be eight. Very good. Okay. What if I printed out, uh, let's initialize this array a little bit more interestingly. Let's do iota R, uh, R plus six, like that. And iota is in numeric. Where is my where is <clears throat> It is an algorithm, uh, so it just needs a value. Okay, that's fine. There we go. All right. Um, so this is going to initialize. Initial init. So uh, the array, two, zero, one, two, three, four, five, like that, okay? And so if we come back over here, <clears throat> it's going to, well, it's actually going to match the indices, isn't it? So array element five holds the value of five, okay? So if I did this and I see outed the value of array plus two, what is this going to print to the screen? What do you guys think?
Because array is a pointer, essentially. So it's pointing at array element zero. So if you say array plus two, it's essentially pointing at this spot. This is array plus two. It's a pointer pointing at this element here. So if we see out the value found at that place, yeah, we get a we get a two. All right. Uh, what if uh, what if we did something? I'll leave this up here for you. What if we did something like this? For int i equals zero. Inside equals six. Like that. <coughs> What if we said um, star r plus i equals 10 times i? What do you think about this? Initializing the array this way. <clears throat> what value is going to be printed out here? What value is going to be printed out here? What do you guys think? Cast your votes now. Operators are standing by. What are these two lines of code going to print out? Take a sip of coffee. Give me your answers. No answers on chat. I will pause the video. OK, here we go. 0 and 20. Very good, Ella. That is correct. This is 0, and this is going to print out 20. What this loop? here is doing, it's the first time through the loop, i is zero. So star r is the exact same thing as saying array square bracket zero. Uh, if you dereference a pointer, it gives you the variable found at that location in memory. So the variable here would be r square bracket zero. And then uh, array element one is set to 10, array element two is set to 20, so on and so forth, okay? And, uh, <clears throat> Another way we could do this would be like, well, <laughs> we could actually just do this, right? These two lines of code are equivalent. In fact, in fact, when you type array square bracket i, it's actually doing this. Okay. So option one. And this down here is option two. When you type array square bracket i with a C style array, not with a vector and not with a C++ array class, when you do it with a basic C style array like this, it actually does syntactic sugar. It actually replaces the code essentially with something that looks like this. So if I were to change this back out and I were to change it to this, would that still work? What do you guys think? It's going to set array element 0 to 0, array element 1 to 10, array element 2 to 20. Do you guys see any, anything wrong with that? Yeah, it still works. OK. <clears throat> Great. And so if that works, then this will work as well. This doesn't work with vectors. It doesn't work with C++ style arrays because they the vector class has an operator square bracket defined on it. And you can't do that with this because i is an integer. You can't overload a square bracket operator for a primitive type like that. It just doesn't work. What just happened? What happened, Megan, is that when you type this, it actually replaces it with this. It's just algebra and algebra Addition is cumulative and associative and, you know, and so uh, this code works just fine. If we were to run this code, you would get a 0 and a 20, just as if you had done this. Exactly the same as that. Okay. Uh, this, however, is called job security code. Nobody can fire you if you write your code that way. <laughs> it looks like I is the array, right? It looks like we have an array named I and your index is R. Mm -mm. Because it's syntactic sugar, it actually just replaces it with this. And you can switch the order of them. 
Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I don't recommend writing code that way, though. All right. Uh, so another way that you could do this. Another way you can do this is like this. Um, and this is the, uh, yeah, we'll call this learning point number two. <clears throat> Iterator based for loop. This this one actually comes up a lot. You'll actually see this code a lot. And people will write a for loop that looks like this. For auto iterator equals begin r. Iterator is not equal to the end. R iterator plus plus. <clears throat> see how it's star it. If I could type. There we go. Okay. And so with let's slap a new line on there as well. And so this code here um, is going to iterate from the beginning of the array to the end of the array. You can see it's in the name right here. Uh, you can't say r.begin because uh, C style arrays do not have any member functions on them. They're not classes. And so instead you have to use the global function called begin and that will return the beginning of the array and end returns one past the end of the array. In other words, array square bracket six. Another way you could write that <clears throat> would just be array plus six like that. That would actually work exactly the same or a size if you wanted. It's exactly the same as this. And so this is actually gonna print out the entire array. So we can see we have the entire array here and this also works too. Enter your x and array. See how x. And in fact, see, we got the exact same code. And in fact, this code below compiles down to the code above. It's act it's actually syntactic sugar. Again, so this this looks like you know our, our standard range-based for loop, and it is. But what happens is the compiler translates it into this code here. It actually makes an iterator-based for loop for you. And that's why if you ever try saying for every integer x in size, is size a container? Is size something you can iterate across? What do you guys think? Will this code work? No, definitely not. Uh, you cannot output all of the integers in an integer. Although, you know, you might think it maybe should. I don't know. But uh, no, it's not a container class. It's not a data structure. You can't do it. But the error message you get is interesting. The error message you get is, it should, yeah, that'd be interesting. Uh, the error message you get is there is no viable begin function. And that wouldn't make any sense to you unless you understood that it's doing this. So what it's doing, it's calling begin on size and the begin function doesn't work with an integer because it's not a container of any sort. And so the code will not compile. Okay. Um, yeah. So iterator-based for loops are really useful. Uh, in, in this case, I would I would definitely use the the um, the range-based for loop. It's just a lot cleaner. It's a lot less typing. But sometimes you need that iterator. Okay. Uh, in this case, if we print this, it's going to print all the memory addresses, right? And you'd see every memory address is four to the right of the one before it. Uh, eight plus four is C. Right? You guys know why 0 plus 4 is 4, 4 plus 4 is 8, 8 plus 4 is C, C plus 4 is 0. Anyone know why that is? Hexadecimal. So hexadecimal is base 16 numbers. You count 0, 1, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then 10 is A, B is 11, C is 12, D is 13, E is 14, and F is 15. Okay? So C is 12, 12 plus four is 16, which wraps around and becomes zero, okay? So you cannot say 12. No, it would mess up all the digits. So instead of saying 12, you say C. And so, um, so it goes zero, four, eight, C, then back to zero again, because 16 carries the one to the next, the next uh, digit place, the tens digit, or what we would call the tens digit. It's actually the 16s digit there. So, uh, Hexadecimal is something you will learn more about in CSI 45. 
But uh, it's uh, oftentimes seen in memory addresses. It is not exclusively used in memory addresses. So for example, if you've ever worked with um, colors, uh, if you ever do you like web design, ooh, that was actually a pretty shade. I like that. Yeah. I like that one. Okay. Right here, you have hexadecimal. Right? Hexadecimal, like a lot of students just see a hex thing and they're like, it's a you know, it's a it's a memory address. And and in and in this case it is, right? This is actually in the stack. We can tell it's in the stack because it's at memory address seven ff, which is the very top of the memory. So if we were to draw our memory uh, graph again, then a uh, stack pointer is going to be around here somewhere. The top of memory is going to be seven f f f f f f f f f, and somewhere within here we've got array. You know, and the array takes up like six elements somewhere within here. Yeah, and then the heap is down here. And the code segments down here, and there's more segments as well. But that's kind of the that's kind of the overview of it. So the stacks over here, heaps here, codes here. Uh, stack is limited in size. It's faster to allocate things off the stack. So if you make an array of size ten, you know you can make an array. Uh, that's fine. Uh, usually though, we use vectors, and vectors allocate things off the heap. They're a little bit slower to make. So if you're calling a function like a million times a second. And the function needs like 10 variables. Like I would probably use an array at that point. So, so as to avoid constantly allocating and deallocating de off the heap, which can be a little bit slow. Uh, I would definitely probably stack allocate instead. But I would not use a C plus, I, I would not use a C, I would not use a C array. I would use a C plus plus array like this. And we would say array integer size six. Put it down here. I can use signs. And call this guy R2. And then I can say R2 square bracket 0 equals 42 or whatever. And um, and so this is a C style array. This is a C style array. And basically, uh, this is 100% superior to the Um, I mean, you can't do some of the cool, you cannot do some of the cool stuff with it. Like, like this, you know, if you did this with a, a C++ style array, it doesn't work. Like it, it, it's not equivalent to a pointer. And so, you know, if you, if you want to have, if you want to make yourself look smart and, and like go back and forth between pointers and arrays and do pointer math and, and, and especially this kind of stuff. Like this kind of stuff in particular really doesn't work with a um, C++ style array. Um, then you have to use a C style array. Like they're, these are good for making it look smart. If you understand how to do all these like C style array stuff, then you look you look smart. And in fact, like it, it actually does come up on job interviews for places about. Um, Places like DPS Telecom, which is here in town, like they do a lot of like C style array stuff. Every company has its own like preferred idiom, you know, and, and if they're like, we don't like C arrays, we're doing C coding, like you gotta learn how to do the the C style arrays. Like you can't you can't like not know them, you know, and, and like a lot of the job interview questions they ask are like this kind of stuff. Um in general, though, like if I'm coding, I basically don't ever use a C style array. I always use, well, I pretty much always use a vector. But like if I needed something fast, uh, like if, again, in a function that's called a million times a second, you don't want to be constantly allocating and deallocating off the heap. It kind of takes a little bit of time. So I definitely use a C style array in that case. In general, though, just use vectors. You're good. All right. So, uh, so you can also do this. Um, you can have an integer, integer pointer bob equals array. All right, square bracket zero. Okay, and we're gonna make. Uh, and we're gonna have Cindy pointing at array two.
element zero. And so we could copy from uh, the first element of R into R2 by saying star Sydney equals star Bob, like that. This is equivalent to saying R2 square bracket, sorry, R2 square bracket zero equals R square bracket zero. Make sense? And if we wanted, we could say Sydney plus plus and then do the same thing. So let's hop over to here. The R, Bob is pointing at array element zero. And uh, this is uninitialized, so there's question marks in here. This is array two, is pointing at the first element there. And Sydney is pointing at array element zero. So when we say star Sydney equals star Bob, whenever you have a star, whenever you dereference an operator, it gives you the variable at that memory address. And so the variable at memory address that's pointed to by Sydney is this one. It gives you array two square bracket zero. It gives you array two square bracket zero. That's this guy here. Okay. And so uh, it copies the value of array zero into array two. Now, when I say Sydney plus plus, and this is learning point number three, you can do plus plus with a pointer to move to the next element in the array. So if I say Sydney plus plus, which element is Sydney now pointing at? If I move Sydney to the right one, what element is it pointing at? Correct. It is now pointing at this guy, array number two, sub point one. Okay. And you can do this actually to loop through a, uh, you can actually do this to loop through a, um, an array. So for example, uh, if I wanted to print out all of this, I could say while Sydney is not equal to array two plus size, see out star Sydney plus plus. So this is point number three. Uh, maybe it's three, maybe it's four, I don't know. Uh, pointer loops. So you can do things like this where the pointer moves to the right and moves to the right and moves to the right. It's kind of similar to our array thing. So uh, when we print this, uh, my thing got unplugged. There we go. Um, so when we start off, Sydney's here, then it moves to the right, then it prints it, then it prints it, then it prints it, then it prints it, and then once Sydney is equal to Array two plus six, right? Size is six, right? And so do you remember how like we, whenever we're working with a vector, there's like this mysterious like sentinel node that's like one off the edge of the vector or whatever. Uh, it, it's kind of the same exact thing here. It's actually mimicking this loop idea here. So once, once we hit array two plus six, which is here, then it breaks. So as long as Sydney is not equal to array two plus six, uh, until it hits here, it's gonna print out the value and then move to the right. Print out the value, move to the right. Print out the value and move to the right. You guys understand? So we, how many, how many of the elements in uh, array two are initialized at this point, by the way? And how many of them are, uh, how many of them are uh, not? Like we're gonna be printing out the entire array too. All of them are initialized, all right? Because we have this one here. But then the first element of array we copied into Sydney. Um, if we want to do this, then only the first element is gonna hold um, a 
legitimate value. And so we got zero, and then we got just a bunch of like random, random values right after that. So we did one copy. Okay, so what you're gonna do for lab time now, what you're gonna do for lab time, lab time, uh, you will use a loop like the line, this, the line below to copy all of the elements, elements, elements from R into R2. Okay. It's gonna be very similar to this. Instead of see outing the thing, you're gonna copy uh, all of the elements of array into array two. You have 10 minutes. Again. All right, and we're back. So, uh, yeah, you don't need this here. But uh, if you want to copy all the elements from array into array two without using um, square brackets, especially, just because you want to, again, make yourself look smart, right? Uh, <laughs> you could say star Sydney plus plus equals star Bob plus plus like that. And so what's going to happen, and your loop conditional can either be for Sydney or for Bob, either way, it doesn't matter. Uh, for example, we could do this if you wanted, it makes no difference. It's all good. So what this is going to do, it's going to copy uh, array element zero from R into array two, and then both of the pointers move one to the right. And so uh, uh, Bob moves one to the right, Sydney moves one to the right, then it copies it over, and then Bob moves one to the right, Sydney moves one to the right, and copies it over. Um, some people don't like having a really tight loop like that. Although this is this is literally how I think the uh, mem copy um, function looks. Um, mem copy looks something like this in the um, standard library, and there's a C++ standard library code that looks a lot like this too, uh, especially with iterators. Because remember, iterators they're not pointers, but they behave a hell of a lot like pointers. And so, like if you want to copy from one uh, data structure to another using iterators, they will write a loop like this. And so. Is there any practical use to doing this instead of square brackets? It's literally the same as the square bracket uh, version. So um, Berkeley uh, likes using this coding style. Um, I don't know. It's it's just entirely up to you. Uh, it is just uh, it is just something that you're going to see out there in the wild. Uh, for example, if we look at <laughs> right, uh, like if we look at the source code for IOTA, look. It's literally what we were just talking about right there. Uh, while first is not equal to last, yeah, like this is literally, you know. So uh, I don't know if you look at I don't know copy it or something like that. Then uh, look at the source code for it. <laughs> right. So uh, now Megan split off her plus plus onto a separate line, and that's fine. Uh, this could have been combined into a D first plus plus instead of splitting off into a second line. Um, on the previous one, yeah, we saw it was on the same line. In the other one, they split it off. It's all good. It, it, it's just whatever, whatever makes you happy. Uh, so we could have rewritten this uh, as well. So you can say Sydney plus plus and Bob plus plus, exact same code. If we wanted to, we could have even used the prefix plus plus operator. Uh, a lot of people do that because it's faster. Um, it's actually not, it shouldn't, you should not see any performance difference between Sydney plus plus and plus plus Sydney. Uh, the compiler should generate identical code for both of those. Um, but for those of you wondering what the difference is, if we did this, then our code's going to have an off by one error. Because the prefix plus plus means move the pointer, then do the copy. And so what's going to happen is the pointers are going to move from zero to one, and it's going to copy one, and then it's going to move to two and copy two, and it's going to copy off the end of the array as well. And so if I compile this version here with dash f san it size equals address, it may or may not actually pick up the out of bounds error. Nope, it did. Excellent. So it 
caught the out of bounds error there. So bail Bob. Yeah. But this is the correct code here. And there we go. No, no out of bounds errors. So this is this is a very common idiom that you will see inside of um, you know actual source code. Like it's not it's not just like you know you wanting to look smart. Like this is literally like let's look at Phil, you know, and that's a different for loop, right? And so they're using a for loop in this one, copying the value into pointer dereference. Uh, you know, there's you just I don't know, just kind of have to get, get used to the different uh, the different ways that people write things, I guess. Generate uh, it's an, again a for loop here. Let's see if there's like mem copy. Let's see if that's in here. See if they actually have the source code. They don't have the source code for it. Anyway, it's going to be a, a similar sort of pointer loop. Uh, yeah, you can do a equals b equals one. Yeah, there's all sorts of shortcuts and things like that, and and it really just boils down to whatever style you like. And there's a bunch of different ways of writing the same code. Is size of array divided by size of array zero better than just having a const size? No, <laughs> because then your code's going to look like this. Uh, size of array divided by size of array square bracket zero, and that's just no, don't do that. Um, yeah. it, it, it's just far, far easier to read if you have a size. And and again, you shouldn't be using a C style array anyway. Um, you should be using a vector or a C plus plus array. If you're using a C plus plus array, it would be let's see, put it down here. Um, array of integers of size size named R two. Actually, we already have a name R two R three. And then when you do this, then you could see out array three dot size. You got member functions. Yeah, look at that. You know, you don't actually have to do stupid things like deducing the size of the array from like size of r divided by the size of array zero. This is this is this is a idiom that you will see people do, but uh, it's not. It's not great. It also doesn't work if you ever pass the thing to a uh, function. If you ever pass an array to a function, you lose the ability to determine the size by doing this. This only works if you are in the scope that the array was made. And that's another reason why arrays suck. You pass them to a function, they turn into pointers. It's called pointer decay. And now you can't figure out how, how many elements are in this. Who knows? I don't know. Can we do a range based for loop for every integer in the array? And let's see out the integer. Nope, can't do it there. You do it here, no problem. But once you pass an array to a function, it turns into a pointer and it loses its size information. So don't use, I deleted too much. Don't use C style arrays. Okay, that's, that's our. Our thing. Uh, but yeah, this kind of pointer math kind of stuff, um, it's just, you know, every time you add one to it, it moves one to the right. Every time you add four, it add, moves four elements to the right. You just kind of have to get used to it because like I said, it's just everywhere. Like you'll, you'll just see demo code and they just use this syntax. It's, it's a thing. So, um, um, okay. And also because the uh, the iterator loop um, syntax is also used extensively in, in C++. So for example, let's um, copy this all. Let's comment all this out. So I don't need to worry about making it. So variables again, let's make a vector of integers of vec size 100. And we are going to I'll generate Generate vec dot begin vec dot end. Now we could also write end vec. Yeah. Um, begin vec 
invec and uh, rand like this. Uh, you can actually call vec.begin or begin vec. Either way works. Uh, the reason why this exists is for things like um, arrays, like right here, that code. Because arrays have no member, like C style arrays are not classes. They do not have any member functions on them. And so there is a global version of begin, and there is also the member function version called vector dot begin. And you can call whichever one makes you happy. It's all good for integer x and vector C out x. Uh, let's make the vector a little smaller. Okay. So what is this going to do? Any guesses with this line of code here? Generate. What is that doing? Can you create operators? No. Uh, there's a list of like 50 or 60, I don't know the exact number, of operators that are fixed in the uh, C++ language. There have been proposals to do meta uh, programming and things like that where you can make your own. Uh, there's also limits on the kinds of things you can overload. For example, you can't do something like um, Integer operator square bracket and i array and size six r two like you can't you can't actually do that like you can't add a square bracket operator to integers for example so um, there there are limits on what operators you can do um, print the vector of random numbers yes what it's not well this part's going to print this part generates random numbers through the vector. So it's going to uh, randomly initialize the vector to random numbers. Okay. So generate calls this function on every element of the vector. If you don't want the rand to be producing these gargantuan numbers that are hard to read, um, we could pass in a, a function that we wrote ourselves. Or if we wanted to make our own function in the third parameter, how could we do that? How could we make a function right here and now, for it to only exist during the call to generate, yes, it is time. It is time for lambdas. Okay, I don't know what happened here. Okay, uh, square bracket, square bracket, return rand modulus 10 plus 1. Boom. Just like that. And now it's going to generate numbers that range from 1 to 10. Neat. Without having to go up and make a global function called rand 1 to 10 or something like that just as the third parameter for uh, generate, it's going to call this function over and over again, generating random numbers from one to 10. Easy. Okay. So not too horrible, Megan, come on, let's be honest. Uh, I mean, this does look a little weird, but you know, it, as far as these things go, like it's not, it's not bad. And, and it results in, it results in your uh, numbers looking better than these big uh, unbounded, you know, billions and things like that. Why is the syntax so weird, man? What? What's what's weird about this? There's nothing weird about that. <laughs> yeah. Nothing weird about that at all. <sighs> uh, the square bracket is used for lambda capture. And so I actually use the Lambda capture. I usually don't. I, I, I generally consider it, I generally consider it bad practice. But like, let's uh, let's say you wanted to like bring the size into the Lambda function here. Um, you, you can do like Lambda capture like this, and then it introduces size into the scope of the, of the function here. Um, and now it's gonna generate numbers from one to six. Okay. Um, a little work without it, yeah. But um, yeah, the lambda capture allows you to pull pull variables from the outside into it. Um, like in my in my code, I have the in gilded rows, I have a hash table. It has all my things in it, and I lambda capture the hash table, and I lambda capture um, something else. I don't remember. And then I and so at the end of the day, like I can just say read from read a new uh, magic item from a file or read a new magic item. I say read a new magic item, passing in ends, the file, 
or reading the magic item, passing in the keyboard, CN, and it just reads it, adds it to the database. One line of code is real, real tight, real clean. So, yeah. This is not bad. This is not terrible. Okay. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, and so, and so, like, where would you see, like, um, make this a little bit bigger, uh, size 30, let's say. So let's say you wanted to delete all of the fours in the uh, in the vector. So what you could do is you can see out four, the four fours were removed. And we can see out after, maybe not so big, maybe half the size. Um, so we don't spam ourselves too much. And then we do something like this. We could say erase, let's see. For, for auto iterator equals vector dot begin. So this is going to get a pointer to the first element in the vector. As long as the iterator is not equal to vector dot end, iterator plus plus. And this syntax is the same as for pointers, right? They're iterators, they're classes, they're not technically pointers, but they behave just like them and they're interchangeable in a lot of ways as well. So uh, use get line, do that on set it over the double right arrow. So for your code, you should be able to do like CN into like an item or something like that, right? Like that's that's what the code that you want to have operational. Um, if you use the read library, then you'd say like item um, Bob equals read from the file like that. And that'll read from the file into Bob using the double right arrow operator. So the read library uses the double right arrow operator to do input. And so you can write one line of code like this. And if you want to read it from standard in, you can do that. And so this will read one magic item from a file. This will read one magic item from the keyboard. And how does it know how to read from a file or the keyboard into an item? That's where your double right arrow operator comes in. So you have to know how to write a double left arrow operator to output it. You have to know how to write a double right arrow operator to input it. And it's kind of the, it's kind of equivalent to doing like CN into Bob like that. These two things are kind of functionally the same. Okay. So now going back to this, so this is an iterator-based for loop, right? This is what we had as uh, yeah, right, learning point number two, right? So we're gonna loop through the whole thing, we're gonna delete the fours, and we're gonna do this in a highly inefficient <laughs> method. So we're gonna say uh, iterator, uh, let's see, if our iterator equals four. We're gonna purge purge fours from the vector. Um, some things like erase, they take an iterator. And so the reason why we have to use an iterator-based for loop a lot of the times is because a lot of the functions take pointers, they take iterators instead of something like this where they take values. And so you can say like it equals er uh, vector dot erase. Uh, and so before we had fours in the in the vector, and then afterwards we don't. Okay. And so erase takes an iterator and it purges that guy out, and then it returns an iterator to the next element in the vector, so that it doesn't break it doesn't break your uh, for loop. Okay. Um, this is highly inefficient. Um, erase is an order in operation. And how many times are we calling it? Worst case, n. So what is the total running time of this loop? Size, yeah, n is, yeah, size n. Yeah. Uh, this is an n squared algorithm, yeah. So this is an order uh, n squared algorithm, uh, which is bad. Okay, we can do this much better by doing something like uh, making a new vector and copying all the elements that are not four into it and then copying them back into the original vector because that would be an order two in which is much faster than n squared um, uh, otherwise you can do it is you could swap like if the order doesn't matter you could swap the elements with the people at the end and then pop off the end when you finish that's another that's another alternative so uh, or you could use a list and if you had a list you could delete things like this without uh, 
if this was the list, it'd be order one. It's a vector, it's order n. So there's options. Uh, would that be bad for 500,000 elements? Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> if, you, if you have 500,000 elements, I would not be, especially when there's just a very easy alternative. You know, would you rather do 500 squared operations or a million? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like two in, like just copy, you know, just you go through the vector and just copy every element that's not a four into a new vector and then just copy, just overwrite the old one with the new one. It's order two in. That's a million operations, whereas uh, uh, 500,000, I haven't had enough coffee to do the math for 500,000 squared is 250 billion. Uh, yeah. So divided by 1 million, it is, yeah. So this algorithm here is 250,000 times slower. 250,000 times slower than if you were to just copy all of the elements that aren't for into a new vector, which seems wasteful, right? You're copying all the elements out and then you're going to purge the old one and copy them all back in. Uh, except I think if you copy them all back in, you can actually just do a pointer swap and uh, move out of it. And then it would be like 500 times, 500,000 times faster instead of 250,000 times faster. So yeah, there. this is again why big O is so important. All right, so uh, that is our talk on pointers today. Uh, we're now going to talk a little bit about uh, hash tables, and we're going to do a really brief introduction to double hashing. Let me start a new recording for that.